Good evening. The time is now 8, ooh, 702. I would like to call the Beloit City Council meeting to order at this time. Uh, can we have a roll call, please? Roll call shows all council members present. Thank you. Item 2 is Pledge of Allegiance. May we all stand. Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item three, a special orders of the day and announcements. Uh, we did have our proclamation, but we're going to hold that over into our next meeting. We want to make sure that all the uh, participants are present to receive that. So we'll be uh, moving item 3A to our next meeting, which brings us to item four, public hearings. Item 4A, please. A resolution amending the 2010 and 2011 home budgets related to funding for neighborhood housing services. Thank you. Mrs. Christensen, please. Um, you had previously approved the budgets for 2010 and 2011 home funds. Um, we realized in hindsight that we made a mistake. Um, in 2010 and for 2010 and 2011, we awarded funds to neighborhood housing services for owner occupied rehab projects. Under our home agreement, they are our community housing development organization, which is the first 15% that's take comes out of that grant per home regulations. Um, because those are CHOTO funds, they must be used for either um, they have to be used for a property that they own so they can't give out loans with those dollars um, so the owner occupied rehab is not eligible um, so after discussing with NHS um, what we're proposing is that they use those funds for acquisition rehab projects so the houses would be purchased rehabbed and then resold to um, owner occupants and CDA did review this at um, a meeting about a month ago, and they did recommend approval unanimously of doing that. Thank you. Item four is a public hearing. Um, at this time, I would like to open a public hearing for item 4A. Is there anyone wishing to speak on item 4A this evening? If so, please come forward, state your name and address for the record. Anyone wishing to speak on item 4A this evening? Third and final call, anyone wishing to speak on item 4A this evening, please come forward. Seeing none, I would close the public hearing and entertain a motion from council. Is there a motion for approval? Motion. Motion by Lukey, second by Newton. Any councilor comments or questions? Seeing none, there is a motion and a second. All those in favor of approval, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, 4A passes 7-0. Item five is citizen participation. We've reached a point on the agenda where citizens can come forward and speak. We do ask that you refrain from personal attacks from councilors, uh, city staff. Uh, staff may not, um, and city council may not act on your comments, but we may refer to the proper department to where it should fit. Is there, we do have people that filled out uh, citizen participation sheets. Uh, this is also a time if you were not able to fill out a sheet to come forward at this time. We do like to limit you to three minutes. However, I will be respectful of the time. Um, so the first person that we have is Steve Warren. Oops, excuse me. Good evening. I'm Steve Warren. I'm president of Blake Firefighters Local 583, and I'm here just to talk a little bit about the budget and the process and how we got here and some concerns I have. Um, given a timeline here, um, we met with the city manager out at 2400 Springbrook uh, quite a few months ago in, in anticipation of the budget coming up and he was giving us input on what the budget process and what it looked like. And at that time from the city manager we asked questions and we asked if we could be involved along the way of the uh, budget process and he said absolutely and that um, the organization would be looked at and reviewed from the top down and we'd work together in the process. Shortly thereafter that the first budget uh, proposal came out we sat down with the chief, with Chief Liggett, and he explained our portion of it, and told us that there's going to be some changes, and there'll be some uh, a few amendments to it, stuff like that. And he'd get back to us with the final number of what our portion of the fire department budget was. A few weeks went by. We met again with the chief, and we were talking about the what our portion was and what they came up with for a figure and stuff like that. And and we got to the point in the conversation where it came became clear to me that the, at that point he'd already submitted a new budget with the cuts and what all the um, proposed st staffing cuts are going to make to the fire department. And so by that, we were already taken out, of the, uh, taken out of the process of the, being part of the process, we were taken out of it already. 
Um, I know there's a few more meetings that were held subsequent with the chief. We've talked to him about some of our ideas, trying to work together on this, come up with some proposals, come up with some ideas. And these ideas seem to go into the city manager, but then they never were actually proposed to the council, or at least if they were, they weren't the way we had proposed them, and they were changed to what they were, um, they, they were changed prior to you seeing them. So obviously it was to a point there where we were not going to be heard. Later on, another workshop out of 2400 Springbrook, um, There's some things said at that meeting that weren't supposed to be let out or being talked about. And after, we, after the meeting was stopped, I went over and talked to President Levy and asked him for a meeting with the city council, with the, if we could present our, our problems or our issues to the council. After numerous calls and attempts, they, were never, they went unanswered. And so finally, at another meeting at Grinnell Hall, I talked to Kevin, and he asked if I, if I could sit down and talk to him one-on-one, -on -one, he said he would. But as the story goes, we never got to meet. We never got to explain our ideas or even be heard. So I guess, you know, with you having your uh, vote on the budget tonight, I feel, you know, I've tried to go through the proper channels. I tried to talk to the right people to get with the meeting, at least hear our side of it. If you'd have heard our side of it, at least listen to what we said, and you were okay with voting tonight, I'd say, okay, go vote for it. Um, I know our uh, medical director, Dr. Rick Barney, had sent letters to every one of you. And he had some serious concerns from a medical director standpoint, and I'm not sure how many of you did or how many of you even talked to Dr. Barney. But if you didn't, you're missing out on some important information. So with that, I know you've got a budget in front of you tonight that's it's tough. We've made a lot of cuts. There's a lot of things that are happening, and we're going to be a lot of change of services the way things are going down. And even though you never got to hear our plans, we feel our plans had merit and they should have been able to be heard. And I went through the proper channels and they were never answered. Nobody got to hear what we had to say. And possibility we could, you know, save some of the services or keep the services at the level we are with the citizens. So, you know, it's too bad you're only getting the information the city manager wants you to hear. So I'm asking you tonight to do the right thing. Hold over the voting on this for another couple of weeks. At least you can talk to us and hear what we have so everybody has the input. So you can hear all the sides of the story. And you need to remember that the city manager works for the city council. The city council don't work for the city manager. Thank you. Ian Coote. Hi, um, Ian Coote, 936 Highland Avenue. As I understand it, um, you're considering uh, passing a ban on firearms in public land. Um, just want to say that it's not a good idea because it won't keep the firearms out of the hands of the bad guys. The good law-abiding citizens are the ones that need them to protect themselves, especially in many parts of Belate. So uh, don't, don't do it. Also, um, there are lots of National Rifle, Rifle Association events where they have big picnics where people bring out their firearms. You know, no ammunition, but people bring them off. They talk about them show them off, things like that. And it pulls in people from a large area. Um, if we were to pass a resolution where we didn't allow firearms, we'd close ourselves off to any possibility of events like that. They could bring in people to Beloit. They could see what we have to offer, spend their money at our hotels, restaurants, and so on. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Mike Zorro. I'd also like to speak on agenda item seven about the gun ban. Uh, you guys being city councilors, you get a lot of opportunities to get feedback from the residents. A lot of people tell you, you know, what they think of you. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Uh, but you know, here's a chance where you have a, the opportunity to tell the residents what you think of them. And when it comes down to it, you know, your stand on the Second Amendment and how you view personal liberties. The question is, how do you view you, the people that you represent in Beloit? Are they trustworthy, productive citizens? Or do you just view them as an unruly crowd that needs to be lorded, controlled, supervised, and taken care of? I think that uh, the way that you guys vote on this decision will say a lot about your character and your trust and faith in the citizens. And um, I'd also like to mention that with some of the cuts that we're having to public safety, 10 positions being cut, uh, personal safety is now more important than ever. 
you know, what happens if you have uh, a young mother with her child and they're, you know, maybe using the public transportation or they're going out for the day and one of their trips happens to be involved in a city building or so forth and criminal comes up, makes threats to do whatever they would feel like and you're going to have to give her a choice. Is she going to be able to have uh, a way to defend herself with a firearm or are you going to let her have a cell phone and she can call the police? And if you let her have the cell phone and she calls the police, I guarantee you the police will show up, they will come, and they'll take photos of the body. However, I think it's absolutely important that uh, we don't create pockets within the city of Beloit that say your right to protect yourself with weapons and firearms is not allowed here. But you know what? If you're a criminal, go ahead because criminals they're not going to be paying attention to any kind of restrictions. We, are, we already have laws against murder, and if they're going to be, don't value uh, human life and they're going to murder somebody, they're not going to pay attention to the gun ban either. And so, first and foremost, I like to say that I'm against uh, the gun ban. I think that if the citizens have a permit, they should be allowed to carry it. Uh, I'm also against uh, denying open carry, which does not require a permit. And with that said, I do have a few suggestions to mitigate the ordinance the, the way it's written right now. Uh, there's a fine if you're found in violation at the state level of $25 a piece uh, per violation. City's proposing a fine between $300 and $500 depending on how many violations you have. I say, look, if the guy has uh, his permit and he's in violation of the ordinance, no reason to charge them three to five hundred dollars, only make it twenty-five. Uh, I also like to say that uh, there's a list in the agenda was, uh, uh, where the ban is going to apply. If you were to change that list up, it would be a little bit more acceptable. For instance, uh, here in City Hall, you have police protection. If something bad were to happen, the police are nearby. I, I, it's a little bit more understandable here versus somewhere out in public where it's a little bit harder and it takes a little bit more time for police to respond. Uh, if you're out in a public park, for instance. Uh, I'd also like to say that there's some disadvantages. If you're going to be passing an ordinance, you have to be prepared to enforce it. That means that you need to have metal detectors at all your entrances. You have to post signs. Uh, you may even need to have police officers at each location provide protection for people. You might have to install lockers. You know, someone wants to show up, they want to come inside, they can't bring their firearm with them. You know, if they're at the park and maybe they need to use the restroom, should they set their weapon down on the grass for a child to pick up because it's illegal to take it inside? Obviously, you wouldn't want that, but what are the alternatives? The alternatives is spending a lot of money, which the city doesn't have, to install lockers and, and metal detectors and so forth. And then uh, I'd also like to mention that the way the proposed ordinance is written, I'd suggest that you take out the word locations because it could be misinterpreted. I believe the intention of the ordinance is only to put on a limit in the public buildings and facilities, but it does say City of Beloit locations, and some people that might be misinterpreted in the future as far as, uh, well, does the location apply to other places besides city buildings and facilities? So I'd recommend just taking that word out altogether. Uh, I'd also like, and in closing, I'd like to mention that uh, I just want to read the Second Amendment here. It says that uh, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It's that the federal constitution and the Wisconsin state constitution, Article 1, Section 25 says, the people have the right to keep and bear arms for security, defense, hunting, recreation, or any other lawful purpose. And then I want to mention that uh, Somebody who actually does go forth and get the concealed carry permit, they're 5.7 times less likely to be arrested for violent offenses than the general public, and 13.5 times less likely to be arrested for nonviolent offenses than the general public. I'm concerned about criminals running around with guns shooting at people, but I have no concerns whatsoever for law-abiding citizens to be able to protect themselves. Thank you. Thank you. And the next one is Paul. Can't make up the last name, but 
102 North River Street, apartment 301. I'm not much for speaking right off the cuff, so I drafted a short statement here I would like to read to you. It says, Dear City of Beloit and esteemed council members, my name is Paul Lembrick. I reside in Janesville, Wisconsin. You may well ask, why is a Janesville resident speaking for you today? Simply because you may be about to pass an ordinance that affects my freedom and rights as clearly stated by the Second Amendment to the Constitution of the United States of America. Rather than indulge in a lengthy debate of that subject, I will move on. There are a number of other Wisconsin communities that have chosen not to post their properties against firearms for many reasons. Some communities have deliberately not announced that they will have no intention of posting against concealed carry on their property to avoid demonstrations of anti-gun protesters. Therefore, their numbers are unknown. What is so far known is that the following government bodies that will be allowing concealed carry are, so far to date, City of Delavan, City of Elkhorn, Village of Germantown, Village of Sturtevant, City of Green Bay, City of West Bend, City or County of St. Croix, City of Delafield, the Town of Delafield, the City of Kenosha, Chippewa County, Fort Atkinson, City of Antigo, Dodge County, Muskego Public Library, the State of Wisconsin, parentheses, many buildings, and that does include our capital, and the City of Franklin. I'm sure that as time goes by, it will be found that many other units of government will be found that have not made any effort to post against any form of carry and consider it a non-issue. There is much empirical evidence by a large number of researchers, both liberal and conservative, FBI and others that have shown in one fashion or another the truth of the statement that more guns equal less crime. Here is a book bearing that title in case somebody believes that is a bunch of baloney. This is the second edition and I believe there is a fourth edition of this book. This was written by a professor who was an anti-gun person who after examining the evidence became a pro-gun person. There are many who fear guns for their own sake, as so many people have been convinced by the media that guns are evil in themselves, and that those who carry them are bent upon evil. If I can accept that hypothesis as truthful, then we have a pr huge problem with the arming of our law enforcement agencies. Today's media, soap operas, have been changing the attitude of the American people's familiarity with firearms to abject fear. Women who were often the chief defenders of home and family quite often became better shots than their husbands and are now vilified in soap operas if they admitted to having any firearm knowledge. Several years ago, a very popular Hallmark movie with the usual love, romance, and tragedy theme carried a second theme, as many do. The secondary theme of this movie should have been billed as tragedy in a saga of shotgun ownership. The ownership of a shotgun was transferred from one individual to another throughout the entire show. Each new owner committed a crime with it and passed it to another. Each crime was blamed on the shotgun, not the criminal. An example of subtle brainwashing first class. A firearm in the hands of citizens is no different and no more to be feared than a screwdriver in the hands of a mechanic, simply a tool of a responsible citizen. Thank you. Thank you. Robert Bellert. Counselors, Manager Larry. This is all about our Second Amendment rights. Be sure that the Second Amendment is my right and not a privilege. Rights are given to us, the people, by God. Privileges are offered by governments. What governments give you, they can take away. So the bigger the government, the smaller the people. If you create unconstitutional zones in Beloit or Rock County, you are taking away portions of our rights, the right to conceal carry. Crime, drugs, gangs in Beloit 
and state line are shameful, but taking away our individual right to protect ourselves is shameful and unconstitutional. By creating gun-free zones, you are targeting people for the criminals. In closing, at least for now, follow the newly created concealed carry law until it can be made even better for true constitutional carry. In a republic, which we are, the civil authorities' duty is to secure everyone's God-given inalienable rights, not to take them away. Thank you. Thank you. And Chuck. That's Keeker. Keeker. Okay. I don't live in uh, the city. I'm just outside the city limits that uh, will be in the future on Creedy Road. And I'm a federally licensed firearm dealer. Get that off right away. I think uh, the way the budgets are going these days, you really can't afford to pass a rule like this because I could be carrying a gun in here. You wouldn't know unless you've got the metal detectors and the TSA x-ray machines and possibly the people to frisk you. Somebody could walk in here with a gun right now and be sitting anywhere in this audience. You'd never know unless they were bent on evil. And even if you have a police officer or two in the, in the room, how fast can they respond? At Virginia Tech, uh, the perpetrator went into the building, chained the doors shut from the inside, took his time changing magazines, shooting people. That was a gun-free campus. Nobody was able to defend themselves. There was nobody available to get in easily. The police had to wait until the shooting stopped before they could go in for their own safety. At uh, Northern Illinois University, where my daughter goes right now, there was a shooting. Luckily, she wasn't in the building at the time. She was just coming on campus and saw all the, all the hoo-ha going on, wondered what was going on, found out later. Another gun-free zone. This is uh, what you do when you create a gun-free zone is essentially you create a free fire zone for the criminals. Everybody in there is going to be defenseless except the guy with the gun, and he's going to be bent on evil. If you allow citizens to carry concealed or openly, law-abiding citizens, they're not people, like was said, to be feared. These are people, they're on your side. They're law-abiding, they'd like to help keep the world a, a peaceful place, but they're prepared for the emergency that might come up, like, uh, like a fire extinguisher. A gun is a tool, it's a safety device. If you ban guns in uh, city buildings and uh, washrooms and such, you're also opening the doors to liability. I believe the state concealed carry law says that if you post those signs, you accept the liability for anything that goes on that injures people on the premises. And it also specifically makes whoever does not post the sign not responsible for the actions of a concealed carry holder. So you may have a legal aspect here that you want to you want to consider before you pass this also. Uh, speaking off the top of my head, I think that's all I got. But okay. thanks for your time. Okay, thank you. And that's all the sheets, that's all the slips that we have for citizens participation. Um, is there anyone else willing to speak? If not, I would like to close that portion of the agenda. Okay, there, there's one. Come on down. Gary Fields with the uh, BPMA. I'd just like to um, express the concern of the uh, budget and of the raising of the rental permits. I uh, sent a letter to each one of you um, from the members of the BPMA. Uh, a couple of suggestions that have come up uh, since then is um, I believe the rental permit fee was originally established to create uh, the revenue for inspectors to come in and inspect within the city. Uh, that was a number of years ago. I believe they've done a very good job in doing that, but I believe now it's also coming down to a maintenance fee um, or a maintenance instead of a full-blown program. So going forward, there may be some opportunities there to maybe extend the length of time between inspections instead of every three years, maybe you go every five years um, as a maintenance versus a, a full-blown program, and then an opportunity of reducing the number of inspectors, which then would reduce your budget as well in lieu of raising the fees. Okay. Just a couple of suggestions. If you have any questions, we'd be glad to talk to you. Okay. 
Thank you. With that, I would like to close, close citizen participation at this time and move on to item six, which is the consent agenda. All items listed under the consent agenda are considered routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless the council member so requests, in which event the item will be removed from the general order of business and considered at this point on the agenda. Is there a council person that would like anything removed from the consent agenda? Council DeForest. Uh, Mr. President, I'd like to request that items E and F be removed from the agenda, please. E and F. Anyone else? Seeing none, the consent agenda will consist of items 6A through 6D. Is there a motion to approve that portion of the consent agenda? So move it. Motion by Van der Bogart, second by Haynes. Uh, all those in favor of approving that portion of the consent agenda say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that portion passes 7 0. Item 6E is a resolution supporting the Rock River Trail Initiative. Uh, Mr. Ramsey. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, as stated in your packet, um, the Rock River, 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 the Rock River, River Trail initiative is uh, the mission of the initiative is to establish and interpret a Rock River River Trail along 300 mile river course from the headwaters in Fond du Lac uh, count 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 the count count D in Wisconsin to the Mississippi River at Rock I I Island Illinois and an, and a separate Rock R R River route on roads within the river cor cor corridor to provide access for all the nat the nat the natural re re resources, recreational opportunities, scenic beauty, be 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 and historic and cultural assets of the Rock River Val Valley. To date, new numerous communities along the Rock River have demonstrated their support for this initiative and have adopted the attached resolution. If you allow me to, would you like me to go ahead and read this? I think, the resolution uh, tonight? I think I counted the fourth, if I understand you correctly. There is an individual here that you might want to speak on this. Yes, um, Ryan, is it possible to defer a minute or two to Greg Carter? Sure. Greg is here as the um, chair of the Wisconsin uh, Rock River init, init, init Initiative, and I'd like to defer it to Greg and give Greg a chance to speak okay. as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. President uh, Levy, uh, City Manager Arft, Sheila DeForest, uh, Council Members, thank you for the opportunity to be here. My name is Greg Farnham. I have the privilege of serving as the Wisconsin Coordinator for the Rock River Trail Initiative. And as uh, Mr. Ramsey mentioned, this is a, uh, a public-private partnership in Wisconsin, Illinois, to establish a Rock River water trail along the, the river from the headwaters to the Mississippi River, and a separate scenic and historic Rock River route on public highways that run parallel with and in proximity to the, uh, the, uh, the Rock River. Um, secondly, I'd like to say that you have an absolutely beautiful city. Uh, I think the last time I was in Beloit was when I was in high school many, many moons ago, and I've had the uh, uh, great privilege of spending some time in your city. Uh, we had the opportunity, we meaning the, the Trail Initiative Council, held its first meeting at Vision Beloit last Friday. And we very much appreciated the beautiful meeting surroundings and the hospitality of Vision Beloit. And I've also had the pleasure of uh, spending time on your city streets. We have recommendations from several folks in this area on the streets that could serve as part of the, the Rock River route. And uh, I just very much enjoy my time in, in, in Beloit, and we look forward to the, having the, the city's support and involvement in this, this work. Uh, ultimately, our, our, our hope is that the, uh, the Rock River Water Trail will become a national recreation water trail. We're working with the National Park Service in that regard and with the Departments of Natural Resources in Wisconsin and Illinois to further that, that objective. Ultimately, we will be making application through the U.S. Department of the Interior 
and are hopeful that we will be one of the um, recreational routes selected by the, the Secretary for national designation. And we believe that will bring with it a, um, a heightened public awareness of the important uh, water resources of the Rock River and the important recreational opportunities that the, uh, the, uh, the, the river presents to all of us. So again, uh, I know you have a big agenda and I do appreciate very much the opportunity to be here and we very much ask for your support. As Mr. Ramsey said, I've, uh, I've also had the pleasure of um, connecting with all of the cities and villages and the five counties in the Rock River Valley in Wisconsin. And we have support resolutions and support letters from each of the five counties, Fond du Lac, Jefferson, Dodge, Dane, and Rock, and all of the cities and villages, and we hope to add the, the city of Beloit to that list. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Council DeFore, is there any uh, uh, information? Hearing that, is there a motion uh, for approval? Mo motion by Haynes, second by Newton. All those in favor of approval say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, 60 passes 7-0. Item 6F, please. A resolution concurring with the city manager's decision to authorize the city of Beloit to apply for and enter into a grant agreement for the hydrogen fuel use in municipal fleets grant through the Wisconsin State Energy Office. Beth, take us in, please. Good evening. Um, in 2009, the city was awarded a, a grant through the Department of Energy, and at that time, the city began to install and test hydrogen on demand systems in the si several of our city fleet vehicles. Um, and I just want to preface this that I am not doing any of this work. Um, it's public works. It's specifically Danny Lutz, Bill Mickelson, Brett Abear, and our fleet guys. So if you have really technical questions, you're going to have to ask them. Um, but during that time, they've produced um, some modest but promising results um, with fuel economy and emissions testing. So the hydrogen program not only helps supplement fuel economy, but it also makes a cleaner um, exhaust. So there's there's a two there's a two part to this. Um, staff believes that using hydrogen to supplement diesel um, and unleaded fuel has shown promising results and is worth further investigation. Um, as, as you know, um, this grant is, is pretty ex exciting for the city of Beloit because we're the only municipality in the state doing this type of testing. Um, as we indicated earlier, um, this grant kind of just showed up and because there were five Mondays, I think that was in October, it got a little hairy, but we did um, apply for the grant. And funding for this grant, uh, will, the money that will be used will be used fringe benefits, all associated costs with the program, and um, and other related expenses. They're building not just the actual units, but housing the units and installing them in vehicles. Um, this grant is through the state of Wisconsin, the State Energy Office, or the SEO, and it will allow the city to partner with the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Cummings Engine Corporation, and UR Water. Those relationships have already been formed, but this is going to be a little bit more dynamic in that um, they're going to partner with us and and really give us their experts. The installation of these of this equipment into the vehicles does not um, affect the warranty. It's a supplement to the actual vehicle. So if that's a concern of yours, it's 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 sort of a non-issue. Um, I can tell you that in the last year or so, um, we were slowed down last year um, based on the hydrogen. For, well, the water that's used was freezing, and so they've created a solution so it won't freeze this year. So this year we're gaining more momentum, and they've also done a couple other things to streamline this technology. So it's very exciting. We're looking forward to it. I know Public Works is very exciting, um, excited about it. And if you have further questions, um, I would invite you to meet with the guys in Public Works because they get pretty excited about hydrogen. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Is there a motion for approval? Motion. Motion by Lukey, second by DeForest. Any counselor questions or comments? Councilor Noodle. Oh, uh, Beth, uh, one would think that you were the engineer that did come up with this. So I have a <laughs> great presentation. And what's one of the also exciting parts, as I think you uh, had mentioned, was that the this project that we've been working on for several years started uh, at the staff level. They came up with this and they got excited. They showed us the potential savings and what, what a great opportunity this was for public-private uh, partnerships with educational components. And uh, this is a great opportunity for Beloit to, to, to lead in this area and hopefully save future budgets for citizens years down the road. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll take the forward. Thank you. Um, I'd like to make similar comments to my colleagues that 
this is the, what's so exciting about this project, as you said, is that it started with staff ideas, and it's refreshing to see staff ideas taken seriously and uh, discussed. And it's just too exciting to leave on the consent agenda and be buried there. So, thank you for letting me pull it. Yes, they're very excited about it. And Danny spends a lot of his time with um, his friends now at the University of Wisconsin Madison. So he is very passionate about it. We're excited, and um, you know, it's nothing but positive for the city of Beloit. Okay. <clears throat> there is a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none. Six F passes seven zero. Item seven is ordinance. So seven A, please. A proposed ordinance to repeal and recreate section fifteen point oh seven sub one to create section fifteen point oh seven sub one G and to amend sections fifteen point oh one and fifteen point three zero of the Code of General Ordinances of the City of Beloit pertaining to dangerous weapons in city buildings. Assistant Attorney Krieger. Thank you. On November 1st, 2011, the Personal Protection Act became effective. The act permits citizens of Wisconsin to obtain a license to carry concealed weapons anywhere in the state, except where it's prohibited by law or by a property owner. Prior to November 1st, both state law and city policy prohibit the possession of dangerous weapons on city property. After November 1st, the city has the option to allow license holders to carry, possession, to carry or possess <clears throat> excuse me, dangerous weapons in municipal buildings. Municipalities are limited to only prohibiting weapons in buildings and not on all public grounds. The city may also not regulate the possession of weapons when they're within vehicles in the parking lots of municipal owned uh, buildings. The, the prepared ordinance conforms with the policy in the state law that was in effect prior to November 1st. The ordinance prohibits the possession of dangerous weapons at all public build, excuse me, all municipal buildings and facilities with the lone exception of law enforcement officers. The ordinance further authorizes the city manager to amend the city administrative policies employment, excuse me, employee handbook to prohibit city employees from possession or use of dangerous weapons during the course of their employment. If the proposed ordinance was not something the city um, council was wishing to do, there are other options that the council could consider. Um, you could allow uh, license holders to carry their weapons in the city buildings or facilities, and that can be um, either a member of the public or it can be a city employee. You can allow the carrying of weapons other than firearms. That would be a knife or um, a billy club is another example under the statute um, in city buildings or facilities. And again, you're both looking at public, uh, the public itself or the employees. Um, you should make decisions about allowing employees to carry weapons when they're in their city vehicles. And also should make, some, make a determination about employees carrying weapons during the course of their employment. Uh, an example of that would be a housing inspector going out to do property maintenance inspections. Although they could carry a weapon in their private vehicle if they're on city business, um, you could make a determination about whether they could or could not carry a, a firearm or a weapon during the course of their employment. Um, I was asked to prepare the ordinance as it is written uh, to you today. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, any councilor have any question? Councilor Van de Bogart. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. Can you speak, uh, Ms. Krieger, to the issue of enforcement of whatever ordinance we might end up passing, if any? And can you also speak to the issue of liability and how that interplays with the state statute, current city liabilities, and, and, and that, that general issue? Um, as far as informant, enforcement, what do you mean? Like, Well, if we, if, we say, if we say no weapons in here or you pick the spot, how do we enforce it? Um, well, currently, you're not allowed to carry firearms or possess dangerous weapons at City Hall, and we don't have metal detectors or anything like that. Um, so that I don't envision um, that happening. It would just be a similar process to what we're doing now. As far as the liability aspects of the law, they are complex. Um, the law was uh, drafted to give immunity to those uh, private or property owners who do not ban the possession of firearms or weapons. That does not, however, apply to um, other types of immunity that the city would have. Um, so I don't think the decision should be based on simply uh, the immunity um, aspects of that law because there are, it, it's unclear how those are going to play out. For example, um, if a grocery store decided to ban the possession of firearms, or excuse me, to allow the possession of firearms, and a firearm were to go off by accident, uh, someone slipping on a grape, for example. Um, the immunities that were provided to that business owner under the statute would not necessarily protect them in that scenario where the weapon was accidentally discharged. Well, but we're not, we're not a grocery store, we're a municipal corporation. And what sort of liability would we entail if we posted it or if we didn't post it? Um, we do enjoy several other types of immunity that would come into play. 
Anything else? Councilor Vanderbilt? No, thank you. Councilor Spreitzer. Thank you, Mr. President. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, I was wondering, uh, you, just to clarify, this is uh, exactly identical in terms of what sort of weapons are banned and the locations where they're banned to current ordinance except for the locations that cannot be banned now under state law. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. So there, more places are permitted, but no more places are excluded. If we pass this, then what has been up till November 1st? Correct. Um, what did you do, uh, use to base the fine scale on? If you look at the ordinance, the fine scale um, is set. Mr. Zora was incorrect with the, his statement about someone who is lawfully carrying a weapon if they are found in violation of that law, that they would not be fined $25. Um, if you look at subsection 4, um, the offense that's adopted under 175.60, that shows $25 fine across the board. Right. That's a fine for anyone to be in violation of the carry concealed law. If someone is in violation of the carry concealed weapon as it currently is, if uh, someone who is non-license holder was found in possession of a, a concealed weapon, the forfeiture actually remains the same as it is now as well, the 300 to 500 depending upon the, the type of or the number of violation. So am I understanding correctly that if you have the license but you don't have it on you, that's $25, but if you're carrying with no license, uh, that's $300? If you're caught carrying concealed and you, have, you just don't have your license document on you and they can verify that you have a valid license, you could get um, cited for $25 plus costs. That violation is actually voidable within 48 hours if you present your document to the police agency that wrote you the ticket. Um, if someone who does not have a license is caught with a concealed weapon, that fine would be the $300. And what, it, uh, what about if somebody who has a license is carrying on city property where they're not allowed regardless of the license if we pass this ordinance? That would be the $300. So that's regardless of license, no license, if they're in one of the banned locations, that's $300. Correct. Okay. Uh, two more questions. Uh, I had a couple of uh, questions before the meeting from people just wondering about the definition of uh, dangerous weapons, wanting to make sure they're not going to get in trouble for having a pocket knife or something else that they might normally carry. Uh, can you give me an example or help me figure out where the line gets drawn on that if we're not talking about guns but knives or other things like that? Um, I th under the, the current, current carry concealed, I think we always struggle with that. Um, with uh, I do a lot of the prosecution for the city. and, and we have uh, kids that possess knives during, at school and things. Um, there's a lot of officer discretion with regard to the, the little pocket knives, um, but a pocket knife could potentially be a dangerous weapon under the law. Um, if that was something that you wanted to exclude was a particular knife with a particular um, inch length that you wanted to exclude from the definition, that's something certainly you could do. Um, okay, and then uh, I was just wondering if we uh, have received any input from uh, city employees. I know uh, it would be possible we could allow city employees uh, to carry uh, in city buildings without allowing the general public. Uh, do we know if there's been any interest in that? Are, are, are there city employees who are concerned about allowing carry? Are there city employees who are concerned about uh, wanting to be able to carry uh, in either direction on this? I didn't do any particular poll and no one has approached me about that. Um, the proposed ordinance was sent to all division and department heads, um, so I can't speak if anyone um, of those individuals received any feedback. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilor Haynes. Actually, uh, uh, Councilor Spicer handled one of my, the <coughs> part of my question, because I, I, I am concerned with the, the language uh, talking about dangerous weapons and dealing with particularly sm small cutting instruments. Uh, I, I think it's. I think the de definition strikes me as too, too broad, and I, I think uh, that we should consi should consider tightening up and, and, and codifying that uh, much much better than it is it's uh, stated here. But I think we've got time to do to do such thing. I think the language is over anyway, so I see no reason to beat that up extensively this evening. But I, I, I do, that does represent a concern of mine. That is the definition that's in the state statute. That's where we pulled that definition from, just so you're aware. Okay. Anything else, Councilor Haynes? Any other? Councilor Newell? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, so, uh, someone had brought up the question about uh, uh, state employees, and it sounded like specifically uh, law enforcement agents. And if uh, the, the way I'm reading this in Section 1 and Section 5, it makes very specific references to law enforcement officers while they are on uh, uh, in city buildings or on, on premise, uh, and so they're. 
active law enforcement are, officers are excluded by state law and by our local ordinance for this. Okay. And then there was another question about uh, if also then that was in section one uh, where it says uh, of the fourth line down, uh, remain in city of uh, municipal buildings, facilities, or locations. Does, is locations, could that be conceived uh, too ambiguous and too open for interpretation? Well, we're only allowed the ability to, to regulate within buildings. If the council wants to strike that, they certainly can do that. I think the locations I, I used because we were talking about different specific addresses and it was just the term that I used, but if you want to exclude it, you certainly have that, that ability. Well, uh, one can see that also in section one that you have listed uh, specific and exact locations uh, that are uh, public buildings that people frequent. Uh, so I, I think that personally. We attempted, I worked with our risk manager to try to get all the buildings that we have in our insurance policies as try to have a, a guide for all of that. I left it open for any future type buildings that would come into our possession. Um, that's why there's the, um, the but not limited to language just in case we were to purchase a building and use it as a city facility without having to quickly come back and amend this, we could have the protection there if that's what the council decides to do and then come back to amend the ordinance. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Alter Haynes. A um, minor point occurred to me. Uh, we say park buildings other than uh, open air uh, park shelters. Um, so we're intending to ban bathrooms. It would be any park buildings if you wanted to exclude bathrooms. If you felt that was, you certainly could do that. Just struck me as a matter of practicality if they're, if they're out there, you know, we, we potentially let them use the bathrooms without causing to break the law. Well, they could also go back to their vehicles and put it in their vehicles if they felt strongly about it, but it's it's completely up to the council what you'd like to do. Anything else, Councilor Haynes? Councilor Sprite, sir. Uh, just uh, one other quick follow-up. Uh, what is the current uh, status and what's the status under the law in this ordinance uh, on city buses? City buses are, there's, they're a little bit different take. Well, we're going to deal with any possession of weapons on buses we're going to do through a policy. Okay. Um, it, which would uh, be not allowing on? It's, yes, it's my understanding that Ms. Gavin is shaking her head yes, okay. that we would ban weapons on, uh, on public transportation. And is that the current policy as well? Yes. Okay. I, mostly just wanted him against kind of thing. If we were allowing it on buses, then it might make sense to allow it at the transit center so people can go in and out. But if we're not, then that would appear to be a moot point. Uh, thank you. Okay. Councilor Lupke. Attorney Kruger, one of the speakers mentioned poss possible liability if, if people weren't allowed in with guns. We didn't pass the ordinance. Wouldn't there be a greater liability if people were in with guns and somebody brought a gun out and somebody else in a room like this started firing back? And innocent people were killed. I think questions about about liability and, and risks um, are are very complex, and um, I don't think I could adequately address all of that before you tonight. Um, certainly, when you have uh, firearms or when you have any kind of behavior that doesn't conform to what the the laws are, you do have some risk available. But I couldn't comment on whether allowing or not allowing would provide any greater or lesser risk. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Seeing none, is there a motion to lay this over? Motion by Haynes. Is there a second? Second, second by Lukey. All those in favor of laying this over, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none. Seven zero. Item eight is appointments. There are none. Item nine, council activities and upcoming events. Councilor Sprite, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, again, uh, I've been continuing to work through the budget in preparation for uh, consideration tonight. Uh, also, in light of our earlier vote about the Rock River uh, Recreational tr uh, Water Trail, uh, I had a chance to get out one last paddle on the Rock River the last weekend uh, for Halloween, and uh, it was uh, quite nice to be out there. So, uh, very excited about the uh, resolution we passed tonight, and hope that that trail project has a chance to move forward. Thank you, Councilor Noonan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'm sure uh, I could speak for which I never would do, but for any of the, the counselors and really anyone on the staff and, and many concerned citizens, uh, that it, it has been a long budget process and vote tonight. Uh, I just wanted to uh, very sincerely appreciate people's honest efforts to, to try to bring forward uh, concerns and try to work as hard as they could to make extremely difficult decisions. And however it does get passed, whether it's in its current form or if there are any changes, 
Uh, it obviously will impact uh, real people's lives. Uh, and I greatly appreciate uh, people's efforts to minimize the impact on, on citizens, especially looking at uh, those that will need uh, special services uh, and also considering that we need to try to maintain the highest quality of life because not only is that great for retaining citizens, but it's also a great economic tool for attracting businesses. <coughs> I, I, I do want to thank everybody. It's a very complicated budget, but I think it's well balanced. And uh, thank you all for your efforts. Thank you. Council Lukey. Uh, on behalf of the City Council, I want to congratulate our City Manager for his election to a leadership position with the League of Municipalities for the State of Wisconsin. It's a real honor for Beloit. Congratulations. Councilor DeForest. I have nothing. Councilor Haynes. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to remind the public that uh, on, on the ordinance uh, item number seven that this was a layover that we will we, we you do have an opportunity to discuss this and, and give us your feedback over the next couple of weeks and I'll, I'll, I'll hope to hear from each one of you. Thank you. Councilor Randy Bogart. Uh, nothing this evening, Mr. President. I have nothing this evening as well. Item 10 is city manager's presentation. 10A, please. Okay. A resolution authorizing the issuance and sale of approximately $4,325,000 in taxable general obligation refunding bonds, series 2011B. Mr. York, please. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, as you may recall, at your last uh, council meeting in October, uh, the council authorized the sale of some refunding bonds uh, to refund some of our uh, outstanding debt uh, for debt at a lower interest cost. Um, we had the sale of those bonds this morning, and um, it's my pleasure to, to uh, to say that uh, our, we came out uh, far better than we expected earlier. Uh, the savings uh, that it's expected to be generated over the term of these bonds uh, is in excess of uh, $430,000, and it's about $120,000 more than we originally anticipated. Um, we also were able to uh, downsize the issue somewhat from the original amount of uh, $4,325,000 uh, to $4,280,000. And with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Don Gunderson. She's with our financial advisor, Ellers & Associates. Uh, they're the firm that handled uh, this transaction for the city and the sale this morning. And uh, Don's here to go over some of the details of, of this morning's bond sale. So Don? Thank you, Paul. Um, good evening. You've been provided with a packet of information. Uh, contains two documents. One, the actual resolution authorizing the issuance and the sale of the bonds. Uh, that was prepared today by your bond counsel, Quarles and Brady. And uh, it is the resolution that you'll be considering this evening. As Mr. York mentioned, uh, the size of the bonds were reduced from the original um, authorizing resolution to proceed with the sale of $4,325,000 and was reduced down to $4,280,000. It accomplishes the same goal of refinancing the outstanding taxable issues, one GO taxable bond and three um, outstanding taxable state trust fund loans. Uh, this is done as a current refinancing and uh, we took bids this morning, or actually at noon today, for the issue. Uh, the other document in the packet is the actual sales results. It includes behind the cover sheet the uh, bid tabulation, which is the bids we received on the issue. We received two bids, uh, one from BOSC Inc. out of Menominee Falls and the second with Baird out of Milwaukee. Uh, BOSC was the winning bid with a true interest rate of 2.94%. Uh, that's the determination to uh, uh, separate the uh, um, and compare the bids received. After adjusting the bids down, it also reduced the interest expense. Uh, the adjusted tick is 2.9%, so we feel that's a very good rate for taxable 
uh, debt. These debts will, this debt will go out um, till 2025 and, and as mentioned earlier, refinance the existing um, outstanding obligations. Uh, the remaining pieces of the packet include the comparison of the preliminary sizing on page two to the actual sizing, illustrating the reduction in um, the size of the bonds and the comparison of the planning estimates on page three. Um, as Mr. York mentioned, we were estimating um, based upon an issue sold the day we set the sale in October, about 311,000. The actual results of today's sale will generate $437,000 of savings over the life of the issue, bringing that to a net present value savings of over 8.7% or $357,000 on a net present value basis. So uh, we're re pleased to report uh, this sale result and um, um, ask that the resolution be considered to adopt and accept the bids. The last document included, or the last few pages of the document are the um, updated rating. Uh, Standard & Poor's has rated these bonds at the, and affirmed the um, city's debt rating on all its outstanding issues of A plus. The rating report is attached. Um, it should be reviewed. It's, it says some very positive things about the um, um, financial management of the, of the city and uh, it uh, provides a stable outlook in ensuring that the debt will be paid in the future. Okay. So if there's any questions, I'm pleased to answer them at this time. If I could first get a, a motion. Motion by Noonan, second by Lukey. Councilor uh, Lukey. Don, am I correct in saying that this is going to save taxpayers $1.4 million? Actually, the, there have been two refinancing done in the last uh, month and a half. This one and the tax exempt financing. Between the two, it's a combination of that savings. Uh, the savings on this are actually benefiting some of the uh, projects that were taken into place in the tax increment districts of the city and will uh, assist in closing that district out and putting those values back on the tax base for the community. Thank you. Councilor Randy Bogart. Can you explain, Ms. Gunderson, why this money that we'll be saving is not available for current use or in, in, our, in our regular budget cycles and how it's restricted? Can you explain it's, that to everyone? There, there will be annual savings um, so much every year, as illustrated on the uh, um, example there. Uh, again, for this taxable issue, they're, they're projects that have been financed for purposes for economic development and are supporting those projects. Uh, some of that is not directly placed back on, on the levy. It's supported by the revenues from your tax increment district. Um, and those obligations will then continue to be paid out of that, those sources of dollars. Councilor Noonan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Ms. Gunderson. It's always a pleasure, especially because uh, when you show up, we usually save money. So thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. We're glad to do that for you. Need to have you come you. visit more often. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, this uh, current summary, every time that we do reissue one of these, and, and uh, they do such a fantastic job, there's always a summary uh, attached that comes from the, the uh, credit rating agencies. And this particular one was just uh, so nice to read and it's very for those that, that don't see it here it's very honest and realistic it talks about the, the true challenges that Beloit has had and we will have going forward it talks about the Janesville plant closing it talks about the Belvedere plant being reduced it talks about our unemployment challenges it talks about uh, uh, our um, household household income challenges it's a, it's a very honest and realistic uh, snapshot of the city of Beloit and it's so exciting to see uh, these rating agencies still find Beloit in an A-plus bond rating. It's one of the most significant things that has happened in the last decade. We were not always so fortunate to be in such good financial shape. And this has saved us millions and millions of dollars. So thank you so much to the entire organization, citizens for participating, our city management, uh, Larry and, and Paul, uh, and directors, job very well done. Thank you. Thank you. Any other council questions or comments? Seeing none, there is a motion and a second, and we need a roll call on this. DeForest? Aye. Haynes? Aye. Vanda Bogart? Aye. Levy? Aye. Lukey? Aye. Newnham? Aye. Spritzer? Aye. Passes 7 0. Thank you very much. Thank you. Item 11. 
Reports from boards and city officers, 11A, please. A resolution approving the 2012 Annual Action Plan and Community Development Block Grant Budget. Community Development Authority recommended approval, 501. Ms. Christensen, please. To maintain its eligibility for community development funding, the city must submit an annual action plan each year. Um, that's what this document is. It includes specific objectives for housing, homelessness, public housing and community development. It also includes information on the CDBG process, affordable housing, special needs populations, and the CDBG budget. This is an annual plan. Um, we did a 2010 to 14 consolidated plan. This just takes off from that. Um, it is really business as usual. Um, the process for allocating our community development funds included making applications available to agencies, having them present their application to the Community Development Authority, and then having the Community Development Authority make their recommendations to you on how those funds should be allocated. A public hearing was held by you at your last meeting, um, and now on your agenda tonight is approving this plan and adopting the budget. Um, we did um, go in terms of the budget. Um, we are allowed to set a cap for the public service of no more than 15%. We did go right up to the cap at 132,795, which we did get a request from Councilor Noonan to do that. Um, so we tried to accommodate that um, to provide, you know, the greatest needs on the social service agencies because we know that our citizens um, are having difficulties. It does have 191,965 under planning and program administration, um, 136,625 for code enforcement, and then under housing rehab, we have 144,615 split between Community Action for the Merrill Housing Initiative and the City's Housing Rehab Revolving Loan Fund. And then the second page of your budget just shows the program income um, generated um, for a total amount of um, $359,825. Um, they are all eligible activities under the Community Development Block Grant Program. They do meet one of the three national objectives and they will all be incorporated into the Annual Action Plan before it is submitted to HUD. Um, there was there's a required 30-day public review. We did put a notice in the Lloyd Daily News, published a notice on the website. No comments were submitted to the planning department, and it's on your agenda tonight because we have to submit it to HUD by November 15th. Okay. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve? Motion. Motion by Lukey, second by Newton. Council question? Council Newton? Oh, uh, thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to thank Ms. Christensen and the CDA and uh, others. Uh, I, it's not easy to um, go to the 15. A community doesn't have to go to 15, and when every penny is so tight in our budgets, uh, I, I'm so uh, appreciative that we're looking out for those that are the most vulnerable in our community in one of the tough economic times in probably all of our lifetimes. Thank you very much for your hard work. Thank you. It's been motioned and second. Any other council have any questions? Seeing none, I would, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, none passes 6-0. And if we can get Council DeForest back, please. <clears throat> and item 11B, please. A resolution approving the 2012 Home Investment Partnership Budget. The Community Development Authority recommended approval 6-0. Mrs. Christensen. Um, we are part of the Rock County Home Consortium. The cities of Lloyd and Janesville and Rock County are part of that consortium. According to our agreement, 15% um, of the home funds are allocated to a community housing development organization in Beloit. Um, that organization is NHS. At this point, they're the only one that qualify as a CHOTO. Um, and then under the agreement, we receive 19% of the dollars. Um, at this point, we're estimating um, that the city share is 105,886 and the Choto share is 83,594. That's based on current year budget because I don't believe the feds have yet approved a HUD budget. Um, so that's what we're estimating at this point. Um, on September 28th, the CDA did um, consider this and did recommend that the 105,886 be used for the city's housing rehab revolving loan fund for both owner occupied and renter occupied properties and that the Choto dollars be used by NHS for its acquisition rehabilitation program. Thank you. Is there a motion for approval? Motion, motion by Newton. Second. Second by Vander Bogart. Any council comments or questions? Seeing none, it's been motioned and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, passes 7 0. 
11C, please. A resolution approving the 2012 Business Improvement District Plan and Budget. Ms. Bratz. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Thank you. I gotta Good evening, counselors. <laughs> <laughs> um, what you have before you is a 30-page work plan uh, and our operating plan for our budget for 2012. Um, I mentioned the work plan because it really speaks to um, our board's unanimous approval of both of these documents, speaks to um, a depth of uh, programming that is multi-layered and complex that is um, all about creating an environment that's conducive to economic success. And so I'll start really briefly, and it's a, it's a long evening for you, um, just on some of the highlights of what we have been able to celebrate this year. Um, from Paddle and Trail being recruited, recruited and actively uh, promoting our uh, canoe kayak launch, the John Rose canoe kayak launch, to Fat Wallet moving to town, to Wisconsin and our downtown, into a building that was uh, easily turned over because the city had um, control of it from Cary. It was a great outcome. Um, to uh, the 306 State Street, which is uh, First Class Cosmetology, tripled their student body and is now uh, has purchased property and is um, completely, I don't know if you guys drove by the, the building today, it's lit from the inside, redone and the facades being uh, renovated, rest restored, and uh, the building next to Bagels and More being restored um, and uh, by the same owners. Um, we won m multiple state awards this year. We won a national award, through Great American Main Street Awards, through the National Trust for Historic Preservation. We're really proud of that because it uh, really holds Beloit as uh, doing a job that is held as a model um, at the national level for downtowns across uh, the nation. And, you know, multiple, I mean, you could just look at State Street and see what uh, some of the TIF dollars that you guys have allowed us to um, work with grant programs to help property owners invest private dollars um, towards their properties and um, uh, really uh, reinforce the integrity, the architectural integrity, historic integrity of our district, um, building by building by building. Um, it's being used, and I thank you for um, believing in us and be able, being able to encourage that. We continue to provide rendering, so much of the work that you're seeing being done downtown. Uh, there were five facade grants that were awarded this year. We had one upper floor housing uh, unit, one apartment that was completed. We've just awarded another upper floor housing uh, grant. Um, and so th the comprehensive nature just keeps going because we have all of our promotions, which most people know us uh, very well as doing because it's a very visible part of our, our programming. Um, we host over, it's, it's 45 days of events throughout the year. Um, our farmer's market, which is um, it's a 22-week season, but then there's the four weeks leading into it. We saw an increase in numbers. We're, we were thrilled last year to see between 3,000 and 3,500 people come every single Saturday throughout the market. And these are numbers that were, um, we were very lucky to have counted last year. Uh, that grew to uh, 4,000 to 4,500, actually it was over 4,500. So we've had a 30% increase right around there in the patrons that come downtown. Um, and the vendors continue to grow. We had on average 90 vendors on the street and even through the construction, um, which the, the State Street reconstruction did not affect them, but certainly the gantry, um, we have had um, just great success at everybody working together for the most positive outcome. And I'd like to kind of wrap up, uh, there's plenty more and I won't uh, continue all night long, um, with uh, the fact that the farmer's market is actually incubating businesses into storefronts. Um, we've seen two buildings purchased by farmer's market vendors that are opening stores downtown. Uh, we have others in the wings that have interest. Uh, that follows a trend of Bushel and Peck's opening. Uh, that was a farmer's market vendor that we worked with for 18 months uh, to develop a business model. Um, to the Little Green Dress, which is the same owners opening up a second shop. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing that really blossom in our downtown. Uh, I think that that's a pop-up uh, businesses are a big deal economically across the nation and we're paying close attention to it and Farmer's Market is very much like that. 
So now on to the details of uh, the numbers that you have in front of you. The budget that you see, the budget lines are essentially very, very similar to what you've seen in the past. Um, one change, it's actually an addition, is that because we're um, a national award winner, the, the state has asked us to host the Wisconsin uh, Main Street Awards next year. That means that downtowns across the state are going to visit Beloit um, and they're going to visit our downtown and they're going to um, get to experience our downtown firsthand. And so we're excited about that and we want to make it shine. Um, and um, I, so d diving into the numbers, that's one of the uh, adjustments. The others are really about our um, executive committee and our board spending a lot of time in workshops. You guys have obviously been doing this a lot at the city level, but for our business improvement district, they've scrutinized these numbers. We've been looking at it, actually a four year, three and four year trend of actuals of our budget, um, projecting out and really trying to fine tune all of these numbers as best we can, um, protecting the investment that uh, our district uh, property owners make in us and also um, uh, making sure that we get the biggest bang for our buck. So the numbers are quite similar. Um, other than that, the business uh, improvement district, which is what we manage as a Main Street organization, um, that business improvement district ex assessment, which I'll explain in a moment, accounts for 37% of our revenue budget that's in front of you. Um, just as a comparison, four years ago, that was 49%. Um, six, so that means that at 37%, 63% of our revenue budget is fundraising, uh, is business sponsorships. Um, should we receive grants, that's where that goes, and any investments and savings uh, that we're able to make. We do protect our, uh, even though our expenses are there, uh, we need to be able to act quickly if we have an economic benefit to jump into, but if we, we are always protecting those expenses throughout the year and watch them closely. Um, Councillor DeForest had a couple of really good questions and I'm thrilled to be able to answer them for you because it gives us an opportunity to talk <coughs> about this a little bit further. Um, she had asked why is there uh, quite a bit of carryover uh, from 2011. Um, essentially most of the carryover is, is held in reserve for uh, accrued expenses and a portion is used to fund our programming. Um, a few years ago, our auditing firm requested that we increase our reserve to cover contracted services accrued each year through the city. Um, we have been working on increasing this amount each year and have been successful to date. Uh, each year we've, we've, we've been able to do that. Uh, just to give you an idea, and it's multiple services that uh, we contract with for the city, um, but the bill total uh, was over 100000 uh last year. And um, last year we reserved 64,000 towards it, and, and as you can see this year, we, we plan a reserve for 86,800 towards it. Um, so it's held in that budget line. Um, our annual carryover is focused in this budget line, but it also funds some of our programming. Uh, we're an organization that takes on no debt uh, other than this deferred invoice uh, from the city, and our carryover would cover uh, actually less than six months operating costs for our organization if you play it out that way. Um, Councilor DeForest also asked another question, uh, if there are any expenses that could be reduced or other revenue that could be generated that might allow us to temporarily ease or lighten the assessment slightly for downtown businesses. Um, this is a great question because it allows us to talk about the business improvement district assessment. Um, short answer. I've already mentioned is that we do continue to raise money each year in sponsorships. Um, you know, that number starts at zero every year. And we walk the pavement and we have the conversations and as um, some of our sponsorships, you know, may not come to fruition, we, we always manage to um, do our best to cover uh, anything that's lost. And we've done a pretty good job at holding that, um, even in tough economic times. Um, cutting expenses would decrease the services to the district, uh, which have continued to show measured success. Um, we've been scrutinizing uh, the success of our programming over the years and really trying to make sure that we do have the biggest bang for the dollars spent and the resources of uh, human as well as uh, financial. Um, our committees, let's see, choo -choo -choo. Um, so their eye is really on protecting our programming at this point. Um, we've chosen to continue to show our confidence uh, and to the district, confidence in the district, con confidence in Beloit, and to future investors, which is really what we want to continue to see the momentum of people um, coming in and, and really making uh, viable 
uh, success in their businesses here. Um, the Business Improvement District, which we call BID, uh, is the acronym, was formed by property owners to develop a funding mechanism in the form of a special assessment. Uh, and it's specifically intended for investment and revitalization efforts of the downtown district. Uh, a bid enables funds to be collected through an assessment based on property value, uh, which essentially spreads the investment by property owners fairly and equitably across the district. So it's not landing on one person's shoulders. You know, a lot of uh, nonprofits out there are fundraising and it, they're always going to the same handful of people and this allows our district to share it equitably. Um, it's important to note that we haven't increased uh, that, the rate uh, in four years, um, while property values have declined in the district by 10%. Um, it, this is an important point, I think, for, every, for people to understand, is that the assessment actually self-regulates. Um, when the market shifts, the real estate market uh, naturally adjusts the amount a property owner will pay. So. Um, which I think is reflective uh, in, well, certainly it's reflective in, in the assessment over time. Um, and I believe that is it. I'd be really happy to um, speak to any other questions that you may have at this point. Hey, okay, at this time I would entertain a motion for approval first. Motion by Haynes, second by Luke Key. Councilor Noodle. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Ms. Bryce. We're glad to have you here. Um, one thing I was looking for uh, that I haven't been able to find and um, we had been working on in our, our workshops was where has the uh, funding fallen for, for upper floor housing? At what percentage and what, 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 and what dollar amount are we at now? Where has uh, the upper floor housing funds? The upper floor housing. I, I believe that uh, council was hoping that the DBA would consider uh, upping that again this year and I was wondering I, I'm really is. pleased uh, that you brought that up, and thank you. Uh, we did vote as long as council approves, um, and I'm not sure. I was asking for a. Um, I'm, I'm waiting for feedback to make sure legally what what we're able to do. But uh, our our um, committee voted to increase the amount, and I should state what that amount is. Uh, it was 30 percent of a total project, uh, up to thirty thousand dollars, and our count our um, committee voted to increase it to 50 percent. Right. up to $50,000 per unit. And um, the big point about this is, is that our uh, tax increment uh, finance district, number five, is really the, any expenditures have to be secured by September of 2012, and we want to make the maximum impact of the dollars that you've allotted. So as much as we can do that. It is, you know, we're seeing a lot of private investment in the facades. We do have people that have plans and really do want to um, invest in their upper floors. Um, it's a little bit more slow moving mm -hmm. than the facades. So yeah. we'll keep encouraging that. Yeah, I think that's great. I'm very appreciative of, of your board for doing that. Obviously, in these challenging economic times, certainly with the housing market, it's uh, ever that much more difficult. Uh, but uh, it is so valuable to improve the property stock in the downtown district, as we know, which is why it's so valuable to have you guys. Any thriving uh, community has a su successful downtown. Ours is beautiful. We still need more foot traffic, and that's the greatest way, I personally believe, to continue to increase foot traffic and that can get more people to put out a shingle and open up a new little shop. So thank you for that commitment. Uh, for the um, farmer's market, uh, my understanding uh, for the last several years, as it continues to grow, the second largest still, I believe, Farmers Market in the state of Wisconsin, only that to uh, the city of Madison? Yeah, you know, true? that's that's a rumor. Okay. Um, I All think right. it's well, pretty close to it. being true. Okay. Uh, it is it is huge, certainly in the region. It's the biggest around. So, okay. um, If we still do have a waiting list, which I believe we do, which was actually quite large, yes. uh, which I believe was like 60-some vendors, is that right, or is that a rumor? Uh, we had a waiting list of over 20. 20. Um, yeah. So it was last year's number. Oh, okay. okay. That's okay. But do you have plans of trying to uh, find a way to facilitate that, or do you believe that that stabilizes the market by having uh, more people that want to eventually come in and, and fill in spaces? Uh, what it does is it allows us to continue to elevate the quality of the market as we have uh, vendors that cannot uh, return, you know, being growing to a point to where we have 120 
plus vendors that participate with us throughout an entire season. Having a waiting list really helps because um, there are times, you know, when corn's not in season and it's a vendor that, you know, it's a farmer that raises corn, uh, we're able to plug somebody else in. Mm -hmm. um, for us to have the opportunity to now say, um, Wow, these guys do mushrooms. You know, they grow mushrooms, and we can we can include them. That's that we can increase the diversity of our our farmers market mix by doing that. We're able to uh, affect the entire quality of of the market. I'm not sure that uh, we need to increase increase the size. Even without increasing the geographic footprint, we're seeing an increase in numbers of patrons. So um, managing that well and making sure that they know about adjacent businesses, which has been part of our marketing plan for some time, uh, is important. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, just a couple more here then. And going back to, uh, as you had spoken about and Councilor DeForest had brought up, uh, so for the last four years, the, the uh, it was what three three point eight eight percent? Is that what it is? It's per um, thousand on the. It's three dollars and eighty eight cents per, per thousand dollars in assessed value. So a if a if a property is a hundred thousand dollars in assessed value, they would pay three hundred and eighty eight dollars for the entire year for for what you know we do as an organization for the downtown. The um, uh, since since I've been on uh, the board, it's been a few years now, but I believe that it's been over ten years since we've looked at the. Um, for the larger properties, the banks and whatnot, not that I'm trying to encourage, you know, increasing those fees on them. Mm -hmm. But uh, the smaller properties have still increased over the last 10 years in values, and we've still continue to maintain uh, $3,000 for those much larger, more vibrant businesses. Uh, has your board uh, once again reevaluated? changing that? You know, it's an interesting question to ask, and I, I just want to state some, some facts about it. We did raise uh, that ceiling, which is the cap. Um, any property that's over $770,000 in assessed value reaches a $3,000 cap. Um, so it could be a $2 million property and they still pay $3,000. That was raised from uh, 2850 in four years ago. So we raised both. There was a 15 cent increase in, in the per thousand um, rate, and then the cap went up a little bit. Um, it is true that 49, it's actually a little over 49% of our district is 12 properties uh, that amount to about $22 million. Actually, it's a little over. So um, have they? No. Um, at this point, I, our board has really wanted not to raise anything. Sure. Um, they've wanted to keep it and really manage ourselves um, financially as best we can with what we have um, and continue to try to generate new um, lines of revenue generation. Um, will they in the future? I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. Well, I, I know you've worked diligently to try to find new revenue streams, so uh, kudos for that. Uh, and then I'll try to uh, wrap up here. So uh, for many years, uh, the, the justification for many of the different events that, that we have throughout the the downtown district were that they are uh, fully self-sufficient unto themselves. Uh, it, not, it is understanding during these tough times that maybe they are not fully self-sufficient. So therefore, as everyone is looking to their belts, their waistlines, are you guys evaluating which ones are profitable, which ones are not profitable, which ones are taking away from the district, and which ones are enhancing? It's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, the justification for uh, for events is not specifically for them to be self-sufficient. Um, it has been, and I've spoken to this group in the past about um, it's an area where we're able to gain sponsorships. It's an area where we're able to fundraise and hopefully cover all of the um, sort of core costs of of, a, of an event. And it's because it's natural for a business to want to associate their name with something that's vibrant and that's an experience and it, it furthers their name. It builds more impressions. It's a great marketing tool. Um, our goal is to bring foot traffic mm -hmm. down. It's to bring people downtown to experience our businesses, some of our, our events are to specifically uh, walk in the doors yeah. of our businesses, Art Walk and Holla Dazzle. Others are for them to gather downtown and linger and realize that this is a place to be, and they come back and they come back, and our numbers have shown that. Uh, we do look at, at all of our events. Um, it has been my goal to have them cover as much as, as it was a, um, and our board, uh, it was a 
specific thing that I wanted to do. As a whole, our events do cover themselves. And when I talk about core costs, I'm not talking about staff time. I'm not talking about operating costs that are appropriated to the support of, of the events. Um, but uh, for all of the other extraneous costs associated with them, we continue to try. Right now, there are two that don't um, fully, uh, are not fully whole. Um, a parade, we would rather people give a donation to Caritas as they come in with their entry rather than a fee. So we make choices that we think are important to the community, and um, we're willing to sort of take that hit on that one, but um, uh, actually happily. Uh, but others make up for it. So I think as a whole, they do. Okay. I hope I answered your question. Uh, yes, very nice. Thank you very much. Okay. Anything else? Any other comments? Do you have any questions? None. There is a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Pass the 7 0. Thank you so much. 11 D, please. A resolution authorizing changes to the 2012 schedule of transit fares for the city of Beloit, Wisconsin. Ms. Gavin, please. Thank you, councillors. Um, okay, um, I want to just mention that uh, what we're talking about right now is proposing to increase the, uh, the fares for transit. Um, last time, provided that this uh, resolution, this, this motion gets passed, um, what will happen is that'll be a four-year increment since we last had a fare increase, which is a pretty significant interval um, in light of the uh, increases that you've seen at the fuel pumps. Um, significantly, we're being faced with a um, sizable loss in funding. Um, the Wisconsin 2011-13 state budget, uh, Act 32, reduces the state uh, subsidy for transit by 10 percent, which actually amounts to about $77,000. Um, as we're all aware, we also can't uh, increase the um, local levy portion. Um, all the city budgets are, are being hit equally right now. Um, fuel has gone up. Health care costs, as you know, have gone up. And uh, in summary, I would say, uh, as far as what we're proposing here, really the only means to preserve the current service um, is to increase the fares to partially offset the significant loss of funding. Um, I do want to say that right now we're carrying about 300,000 passengers per year. Our ridership, I'm pleased to inform you, has actually started to go up again. We had a little bit of a dip. Um, I'm attributing that partly to the economy. People are consolidating. They're not using the bus less. They're going out fewer times and consolidating their trips. Um, but uh, the beginning of this quarter that we're in right now, we're actually seeing, uh, we saw an increase of 9% and then 15% uh, in each of the last two months, and I expect that trend to continue uh, for now. Bottom line is if, uh, if we don't increase this uh, revenue, um, then we would be forced to reduce service. And um, the way transit operates is you can't just simply take a bus off and have it evaporate for an hour or two. Uh, essentially, the service kind of goes in pairs, and so anytime you start to reduce service, it inherently means a lot of service. And um, quite frankly, I'm going to tell you that that affects all of the passengers. Um, we're talking about the proposal is to increase the base fare from $1.25 to $1.50. Um, you'll notice in uh, um, the resolution, it doesn't stipulate this, but I'm going to just draw your attention to it, that um, the student semester pass, we are not proposing to increase that at this time. I feel that that's uh, an incredible hardship for those families. Um, so we're, we're going to try and um, hold tight to that uh, price. Um, again, I can't comment on how long that'll be. I don't think any of us really have that kind of a crystal ball that's operational these days. Um, but I do think that uh, we, we have had some anecdotal comments from the passengers that um, have been alerted to the fact that this fare increase is being proposed. Um, I'm pleased to report that we've had no negative comments. We've actually had very supportive comments. They understand. Uh, and the comments have generally been along the lines of we would rather pay additional in fares rather than lose service. So um, with that, um, you have a resolution 
um, prepared authorizing uh, changes to the fare structure. Uh, I also want to mention that uh, the proposal is to keep the fares for the uh, Beloit Janesville uh, Express the same at this time. Um, at this point, that would make our base fare um, in line with what Janesville currently has, provided that they don't have a fare increase, which uh, um, the inside information that I have says that that doesn't seem most likely at this point. Okay. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve? Motion by Spriter, second by DeForest. Councilor DeForest. Yes, um, thank you, Michelle, for the long conversation that we've had because I was very concerned about the impact on our, our low income individuals and our elderly and disabled. Um, the riders that I have been able to speak with as I've ridden the bus um, have echoed what you've shared that they're more concerned about cutting service um, and would rather pay more than cut service. And so uh, with a heavy heart, <laughs> this is painful for me um, to endorse this fee increase. I am so pleased that we're holding the line on the student semester pass. Um, thank you for being sensitive to what a huge hardship that is for families, uh, especially if they have more than one student. Um, that's a huge cost for them to bear. So thank you for figuring out a creative way to maintain that level of service at that price for now. Um, and I just, I want to thank you for the, the work that you do and emphasize that um, we have more and more non-traditional writers. I was pleased to see the thank you note that transit staff received from someone who I believe they had some car repairs and so we're riding the bus while their car was being taken care of. Um, but commented on how pleased they were with the service that they received. And I think we're going to be seeing more and more of that as people are really pinching um, to save money. So um, thank you for the work that you do. And I'm pleased that we can offer the same level of service. So thank you. I'll share your comments with the staff. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Spritzer. Thank you, Mr. President. I also wanted to thank you for the work you did to keep fare increases as minimal as possible. I know we had. Uh, talked at a previous workshop about uh, whether things might go up more than this uh, and I'm glad to see that that didn't happen so I think uh, I don't don't relish voting for a fair increase any more than Councillor DeForest does but I think given the options this is the best way to move forward and I want to thank you for for keeping it as minimal as we can thank you I will also say uh, just to put this in a, a broader perspective uh, across the state of Wisconsin I think I, I'm fairly confident saying that uh, I'm not aware of any of the transit properties in Wisconsin that have not had a fare increase in the last four years. In fact, I think we were the only ones not to. So we're still going to be um, towards the bottom of the spectrum uh, across the state. Um, so I, you know, hopefully in the next little while we can just sort of maintain status quo um, in, in light of uh, rising fuel costs. So. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Ms. Gavin. And I, I agree with uh, Councillor Spritzer and Councillor DeForest. Uh, all that they had said, uh, and thank you. I mentioned the understanding for families uh, for that have students, especially multiple ones. What a challenge that is for them. The uh, transit system. Many times people don't understand as many other things. In that case, it helps re uh, reduce truancy by making sure that they have a safe and viable option to get back and forth from school and also gives great safety to families because they know then that their child will be safely returned home or to school. Uh, also in the last uh, couple of years, I remember, I think it was last year that you were, um, two, two things. I think that uh, you were having more people with disabilities, mm -hmm. which was great that we're taking advantage of this, increasing quality of life, giving people new employment opportunities and employers a greater pool to pull from to employ mm -hmm. people in our community. But that it slowed up uh, some of the routes and so you'd made some changes and uh, uh, I wanted to find out uh, a year later how that has affected the system as far as uh, making the stops on time and, and whatever else. Um, actually quite frankly I'm, I'm delighted because the uh, the routes are staying on time. Uh, the passengers again it's anecdotal um, but people are commenting that they feel um, you know, more confident in, in the ability to board. What we found was uh, some individuals, particularly elderly and disabled, felt as though, and they're aware that it takes longer to board, and somehow that there was some sort of imposition. And they feel now as though they're, you know, truly a member of the system. 
Um, ridership, like I said, is starting to go up again. Um, when you make changes in transit to the fare, to the schedule, to routes, to anything, essentially, you tend to lose ridership. It's new, people have a hard time adjusting. Uh, and then it usually takes two or three years to recover that. So the fact that we're only one year out and we've already recovered, in fact, not merely recovered, we've actually made some gains. Okay. So, um, you know, it's a little bit of quantitative, a little bit of qualitative, but both, I would say, are, are improving. So I'm, I'm happy. Um, I, again, we don't count the number of individuals that are using mobility devices, but I know that it's extreme. We're um, actually contemplating the next time we build a bus, whatever that may be, um, reconfiguring the interior to accommodate more than two wheelchairs. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councilor Lukey. Michelle, do all tokens have the same value? They do. Okay. Um, I was confused on here because it, it apparently is more expensive for four tokens as opposed to eight tokens on this. Listing. Yeah, I apologize. That uh, should be reversed. Okay. I am not sure what may have transpired there. Um, same with 10 and 50. Yeah, and absolutely those numbers should be reversed. Thank you. Thanks. Councilor Van der Bogart. Uh, Ms. Gavin, do we remain uh, yeah. either the smallest or one of the smallest cities in the state to maintain a regularly scheduled transit system? <laughs> we are not the smallest, but we are one of the smallest. Um, um, when you're talking uh, buses, actually there's, um, um, I'm trying to think now, I believe there's three that are similar sized or two, and there's, there's two that are smaller. Um, and. Uh, but yeah, we are definitely one of the smaller ones, which, I, you know, I, again, I look at that as a, a very positive asset that, you know, the community has had this tradition uh, going back, it'll be 104 years now uh, that we've had public transit here in Beloit. So um, I think it's a very good asset. When Again, when we have 300,000 plus people using it annually, um, our ridership numbers are actually quite high relatively. Uh, if you look at the amount of fare box revenue that we get, um, as a percentage of our overall funding, it's, it's much higher than what you would ordinarily <coughs> expect, um, quite frankly, even for a large system. So. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? I believe we have a motion and a second for approval. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, passes 7-0. Item 11E, please. A resolution authorizing changes to the 2012 schedule of fees, charges, and rates for the City of Beloit, Wisconsin. Mr. York. Each year is part of the budget process. Each department that provides uh, programs and services for the citizens of the city uh, reviews the fee structure uh, that we charge for some of these various services. And uh, <coughs> consistent with prior years, uh, this year we're uh, suggesting uh, changes in a number of the, the fees for services and programs the city provides. Uh, as you can see, it's quite a, a detailed list. I won't go through each of these in detail, but just to sort of highlight uh, some of the fees that are uh, proposing uh, to increase for next year. Uh, the fire inspection fees uh, are being proposed uh, for an increase in 2012. Um, the fees that the uh, fire department charges to clean up uh, hazardous uh, material spills is being proposed to increase next year. The uh, fees we they, the fire department charges for extrication uh, rescue services is scheduled to increase. And the fees that the uh, city charges for ambulance services for both uh, residents and non-residents are proposed uh, to increase uh, for 2012. Um, in our Parks and Recreation Department, uh, we're proposing uh, quite a, a number of changes in the golf course uh, fee schedule uh, for next year. Uh, a lot of this is uh, designed to attract additional play at the golf course next year. Um, we're also, the uh, Parks and Rec Department is proposing uh, increases to uh, fees for our cemeteries, uh, both the East Lawn and the Oakwood cemeteries uh, for uh, grave openings, uh, marker settings, what uh, so forth. Uh, the rental rates for the Rotary River Center are proposed uh, to change. Um, there are 
a couple of small fees increases for use of the pool. I don't believe that this includes any of the uh, normal daily access fees uh, for the swimming pool. Looks like more for specialized type services that are provided there. Uh, there's a couple of uh, recreation service uh, fee increases for picnic rentals and uh, basketball league fees. And then some of our rental rates for uh, picnic shelters and pavilions that are located in the parks are uh, proposed to increase next year. Uh, one increase that's going to affect uh, pretty much everybody in the city, and that's the uh, $1 increase in the solid waste removal fee for next year. Uh, we're recommending that that be increased from 13 to $14. A lot of that uh, is due to the fact that we did lose some of our recycling uh, grant funds uh, from the state of Wisconsin for next year, and that's to help offset some of that loss of revenue. And there are a couple of uh, permit uh, fee increases scheduled uh, for our uh, code enforcement and housing services department. The uh, electrical inspection uh, fees, uh, permit fees, and also the rental permit fees uh, will increase from $30 to $35. All these uh, fees are, are used to offset uh, the cost of providing uh, these services. In most cases, it doesn't cover the entire cost of providing uh, either the program or the service. It's just to help offset a portion of those costs. Um, and with that, I'll be glad to try to answer any questions you might have. <clears throat> okay, is there a motion for approval? Motion by Haynes, is there a second? Second. Second by Luke, Councilor DeBoer. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one that has to do with the golf course. Uh, um, I mean, I don't know if it's more appropriate for Brian to address this. I, I wanted to check with you. I, I did appreciate you getting back to me to let me know that the Golf Advisory Committee did take a look at these fees and were in support of them. And I did look at the survey um, for the uh, the golf course users. There was a mm -hmm. survey that was done, and there was a very high percentage, an overwhelming majority, that referenced lowering the fees for Correct. for golf course as part of their comments. <coughs> Um, I just I wanted to get a better sense of if you could speak publicly about the rationale for lowering the fees. Um, some some residents might say, why are you why are we lowering the golf course fees but not lowering the pool fees, for example? So could you talk a little bit about that, please? And sure, I'd be happy it? to. Sure. Um, we basically looked at three main fat factors in identifying how uh, we defined our our fees for the for the, for this year. Uh, the first one being is that we had a tremendous amount of construction activity at the golf course this 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 year, which we're all well, well aware aware of occurred. And what we wanted to do was try to keep our fees lowered so that we could um, um, show our appreciation to those who bought a pass this year and encourage them to uh, to uh, re uh, return. Um, we felt that was uh, imper per 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 imperative as we actually lost a lot of our pass holders this year, went to other play play places and didn't buy, buy a pass. So it rewards those who did buy a pass for, from, 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 from us for this year. The other concept was we wanted to create um, a, a, a fee structure that would uh, attract and enhance players to want to come to Kruger Haskell Golf Course to play and bring the volume of players to our golf course through various promotional ads that we will be doing. Um, uh, we always anticipate we get a lot of high sales at the first of the year as what we've actually done this year is we're offering a lower fee before March 1st. If you buy your, 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 your pass uh, before March 1st, you get a, a, a huge reduction in, in your cost. After March 1st, our fees go up uh, reasonably to sim a similar rate as they are at this current time for 2011. Outside of that, we thought outside the box, and a lot of commu community golf cor cor courses provide a fee structure where you have a weekday fee and you have a weekend fee. And what we did was we merged those two fees to create one fee. Um, so it's the same rate any day of the week that you come to play. We think that gives us an advantage over a lot of the other golf courses in uh, the area in that fact that everyone then knows our fees are a set design fee each day of, uh, of uh, the week. Um, 
through that process, we find that uh, we made a comparison to all the other golf courses that we consider our competitors in uh, the area and looked at what their fee structures are at this current time as well and tried to be uh, competitive with them. And in many cases, we're offering a, late, a, a, excuse me, a rate that's slightly less than them and projecting what our fee structure will be for 2012 with that new um, uh, paradigm of, of, of having a one set rate for each day of, uh, of, of the week. We think all those things combined will bring back the golfers to Beloit to want to play play more. Um, we created an ad campaign this this this, this year that we want to take forward into next year. Um, talk, talking, it's always been talking about the tradition of Kruger Haskell Golf Course, and what we've done is we've gone beyond that and we said rediscover Kruger Haskell go Golf Course, just play it. Because we believe if you just come out and play it, you'll see it's a quality golf Go, a golf course and the new ponds that were created on the golf course truly do enhance the play for those who are looking for a cha challenging course but yet is a very um, typical course that any average player can come can come out and play and, and enjoy in that regards I think our fees are right within the ballpark of where they need to be to bring the players to 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 or to, to our course and, and hopefully drive the revenue the same way I always say McDonald's drives revenue by offering the val the value board. We're doing the same thing by trying to say playing Kruger Haskell golf course is a val a value in the Rock Valley area, and we th and and we think they they will come. Thank you. Sure. Appreciate that. And I do have another question. Right. If that's okay. Oh, mm -hmm. Nope, not for you. Uh, Maya, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, the other one uh, is probably for Julie Christensen. Um, I, I am concerned about the the renter permit fee increase and the hardship that places on our, our local business uh, men and women who are landlords and how that will be passed on to their tenants. Could you talk about why that fee increase is needed and what would happen if we choose not to increase that fee, please? Um, the city ordinance requires the rental inspection program to pay for itself. The last time we did a fee increase was for the 2009 calendar year. Um, it's really just intended to, co to pay for the increased costs of doing business, you know, doing the rental inspection program. It is a CDBG program income. Um, it is, was the line item. It went up 30000 if you looked on page 2 of your budget. Um, if you um, don't increase the fee, um, it will either result either as it is now since you approved that budget. Um, as it stands now, it would require that's about half of an inspector. So um, either we'd have to revisit the CDPG budget and pull 30 from something else, um, or we'd be looking at cuts in the program. Okay, and then also um, I had asked, and I just think it would be useful for my colleagues to know um, if Janesville has a, a renter permit program. No. And it's a rental permit, because a renter permit implies we're permitting mm -hmm. renters, but we're actually permitting the units um, and I just wanted to so that for people who don't know what that is um, Janesville does not have it it's um, actually something Beloit did in the mid 90s and it was fairly cutting edge I mean and I'm I wasn't here so I don't know exactly what was going on at the time um, there's very few community communities in Wisconsin that have it so Janesville does not have um, a rental permit program or the program to our level and then also I mean just because I think it is related um, how many code enforcement inspectors does Janesville have in comparison to the late? I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I guess my, my concern is um, I understand the benefits of it. I just I think it places an unfair burden on this particular group of business owners. And um, I, I, I agree that, and I, we talked about this in budget workshop, so I don't think I'm sharing anything because it was shared publicly. Uh, my concerns and some of my colleagues' concerns about uh, the frequency of the inspections that perhaps um, those could be less frequent and we could do with less code enforcement inspectors. And, um, you know, I, I certainly, I understand that if we don't approve this increase in rate that it will affect how many code enforcement positions we have. but. I guess I'm saying I don't think it's necessarily such a bad thing. So thank you for allowing me to make that comment. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Spreitzer. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I share some of Councillor DeForest's concerns about the rental permit fee, uh, and I we discussed some of the uh, options around uh, frequency of inspection and other things during our workshops. I think it was uh, clear at the time that uh, that there wasn't uh, majority will to change anything on that, so I'm not going to uh, make any motions tonight. But just wanted to to note that I. Uh, I think it's worth continuing to look at as we move forward and uh, obviously place a high value on making sure that housing stock is, is kept uh, in good condition uh, and uh, improving the quality of our neighborhoods, but that we should just keep an eye on, on uh, what the appropriate levels there might be as, as we move forward and, and look at how we're doing with that program. Anything else? Councilor Nuna. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, I, I can't resist to, to agree with Councillor uh, DeForest and, and Spritzer on, on, on that part. Uh, heard from so many people. It's, it's a wonderful program, and I think all councillors want to retain it. It's just in these extraordinary times when people are having to make difficult decisions, if they don't have to fix something this year, they can put it off. I, I know we give them waivers. But it, it's just getting harder and harder, and we're seeing more and more foreclosures. And any possible way that we can uh, you know, reduce that risk, it would be uh, better for the overall community. But we do need to retain the program because it has been very significant in changing how people like uh, the gentleman earlier tonight, I forgot his name, Greg Farnham, hadn't been to Beloit since he was uh, in school, and uh, coming to Beloit again, it is a renewed. Uh, city and it's very exciting and that is a cornerstone but hopefully we can look at uh, how frequently um, and the majority of foreclosures are coming out of owner, owner occupied not landlords losing their houses so this fee and owner occupied foreclosures are unrelated issues I mean the overall inspection program includes owner occupied people but this particular fee is just related to rental inspections and from what I'm seeing through the sales, it's owner occupied people who are losing their houses and we're getting more landlords picking some of those up. So we're getting more rental units coming on board. So, I mean, this fee is intended to cover our cost for 12 for the current program to inspect about 6,000, you know, a third of 6,000 units. So, I mean, that's really what the fee is for. Um, it's not about the drive arounds the city. It's, these are the interior inspections that this pay, fee pays for. Thank you. Then I. Uh, the reason I pushed the button was, you know, as a small business owner, it seems like you're always getting another user fee. I don't know any small business owner that probably doesn't complain about user fees. And I'm not saying that we don't have user fees. We do, obviously, and I wish, you know, they could all go away and I'd be thrilled. But it would be impossible to balance the budget. And seeing every single one of them in front of you here, you know, I'll admit I'll look at it a little differently, maybe a few more from county, maybe a few more from the state. <laughs> but uh, uh, so... Um, so I, I appreciate you trying to keep them to a minimum. It was one of our only options for balancing portions of the budget. I, one specific question, I, I've been trying to find this one on here. Some in my industry, we call it the grease trap fee, but uh, it must be one with solid waste. And so it used to be uh, a fee that you paid, I believe that one was every year, and now this year it's every five years. Uh, and I, I don't know, I'm not seeing that one on here. Related. That's a uh, that's a mandated license that uh, all commercial uh, property owners and businesses in the city are re required to get uh, for their discharge to the wastewater treatment system. Uh, the permit is issued on a five-year cycle, and the cycle came up this year. So all the businesses and all the institutional properties in the city, anything of a large scale, is required to get that permit. And I think most of those are finished now, we're through the cycle, getting them all renewed, and that won't come up again for another five years. Okay, all right, thank you. Councilor Lukey. Brian, just a quick suggestion on the golf fees. Uh, several fees like the uh, senior daily, junior daily, and the Sunday golf are the same all season long. Why don't you just save some space and combine those? Got we, to twice. we actually combined a lot of fees as, as they are. We. Uh, um, we, we advertise our, our certain rates during the spring and some, we used to actually advertise spring rates, some rates and fall rates, and what we've tried to do is, <clears throat> excuse me, to merge our spring and summer rates in, in uh, the one, which is 
similar to how a lot of golf courses run run their fees and then they change their fees and lower them in the end of the fall so we've actually tried to merge some 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 of, some of those fees so so they would all be uh, the same but um, we've actually had I think three pages worth of fees that we've kind kind of now uh, in restructuring narrowed it down to two because it was very uh, link lengthy I'm just saying you could put down from the beginning March to November, it's the same fee. You've got it listed twice, but it's the same fee. Right. That's just the way it is, it is, okay. it is here. But when we post it at the golf course, it probably will be posted in that regard. Thank yes. You. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing none, there is a motion. Councilor DeForest. I would like to uh, motion for an amendment that the renter permit fee is not increased as part of the resolution authorizing the changes to the schedule of fees, charges, and rates. There is a motion. I mean, there's an amendment to this document. Is there a second to that amendment? Is there a second to that amendment? Second by Newton. All those council discussion. Council Newton. Thank you. Uh, I, I wanted to ask staff if they could explain to us. Uh, uh, now that we have it on the floor, so we can actually discuss it, which we can't without making two motions. Could you please explain to us what, what the impact will be uh, on the budget as best you can? Um, it's $30,000. Okay. I said that earlier. Um, if you're not going to amend the block grant budget to work that in, then it is a half an inspector on average. I mean, that's from what we had. I mean, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it's about that. It's about a half an inspector. So you're essentially laying off half an inspector. <clears throat> Thank you. Councilor Spreitzer. Uh, thank you. Um, if if that were uh, the result, uh, am I correct that we would have to then uh, make an amendment to uh, 11F before uh, looking to approve that to make that adjustment in order to have a balanced budget? I don't, which, uh, I don't the, know. What the, the, bud, the budget itself. The CDBG budget? No. Or the, or, no, it's in the CDBG budget. The... It's in the CDBG budget. Um, the income itself is an estimate. So if all you're changing is the income, um, you don't. If you're thousand up um, out of the new grant dollars, then yes, you. I don't know if you can revisit the budget. <laughs> I don't know how that works procedurally, but um, the, I mean it depends on what you're wishing to do as part of that. So if yeah. you're wanting to pull thirty thousand from one of the applications, or if you're looking to simply change the income line. Um, which was on page two, you don't really need to amend that because that was just an estimate of what um, money is there. So it depends on what your intent is, I guess. Um, well, I guess, uh, I guess I'm wondering what the, uh, what we, what we would have to do in order to, in order to be consistent or at what point we would have to take follow-up action if, if this amendment were to pass. Mr. President, could I please answer the budget question? Uh, number one, you need to take no action tonight. If your amendment passes, the fee will remain the same for this year. The Community Development Block Grant has not even been awarded yet. The budget that you approved earlier is based on our best estimate of what block grant funding will be. Uh, there's also another variable in the block grant funding, which is the local program revenue for the year. Um, if we're able to make up the $30,000, no action would be required. If we're not able to make it up at some point during the year, there would have to be a budget amendment where some funds will be shifted from one uh, CDBG activity to cover the inspection cost. Uh, to, to be very um, direct about this, uh, the rental permit program along with our um, citywide code in, uh, enforcement program are the two cornerstones of the city's neighborhood preservation and redevelopment initiative. It would not be in the city's interest to back off of either one. We work with landlords and property owners all the time in response to economic issues and concerns in terms of scheduling work, making loan, low interest loan funds, deferred loan funds available to help uh, property owners, including investors who you know, are in a financial need. So we do that on a regular basis in any event. We would certainly not want to back down on our efforts to protect and preserve the quality of this housing stock in our residential neighborhoods. Anything else? Uh, yeah, if I could just uh, make a comment. Uh, mm -hmm. 
as I as I said earlier, I do think that this is worth uh, looking at further in the uh, in the future. Uh, and as I said in a in a response to members of the BPMA to, to some questions, uh, I think that um, I also think that the five dollar increase is, is probably not a at a make or break point. Uh, you know, I do want to make sure we keep tabs on the increases. But uh, in light of uh, of the point that we're at and not wanting to uh, jeopardize. Uh, what changes we might have to make down the line at, at this late date, I, I'm not going to support the amendment, even though I do support looking at this continually in the future. Thank you. There's a motion and a second to the amendment. All those in favor of approving the amendment, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. 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 The amendment fails by two. Now to the original motion. There's been a motion and a second to the original uh, motion. Is all in favor say aye? Aye. aye. Any opposed? Passes 7 0. Thank you. Item 11 F, please. <clears throat> Resolution approving the operating budgets, appropriating funds, and levying property taxes necessary for the operation and administration of the City of Beloit for the year 2012. <coughs> including the 2012 capital improvement budget, the Beloit Public Library budget, and further authorizing the city treasurer to spread the city property tax along with the apportionments certified for other jurisdictions upon the current tax roll of the city. Thank you. Mr. York, please. Obviously, there's <clears throat> been considerable discussion, public debate, presentations on the budget this year. Uh, I've had three workshops with the council two uh, town hall meetings, a public hearing, uh, numerous other uh, gatherings and get-togethers to discuss the budget. And I won't go into any detail on the budget this evening. I think we've covered all the details up to this point. Uh, would like to add that uh, we have made changes to the budget uh, from discussions that have come out of the workshops and the public meetings that we've had. Uh, there were some adjustments that were identified and reviewed um, a couple weeks ago uh, at both the, the town hall meetings uh, and uh, one of the public me uh, public hearing meetings. Uh, we did adjust the budget by about, the general fund budget I should add, by about $262,000 uh, based on uh, some of these uh, changes uh, that were discussed. And at this point, the, the total budget uh, for the city for all funds uh, next year, including the capital funds, is just under $92 million. Uh, it's an increase of about one, or decrease, I'm sorry, of about $1.3 million uh, from the current year budget, uh, about 1.4%. Um, the general fund budget, uh, which is the city's uh, major operating fund that most of the citizens receive their direct services from the city from, uh, is just under $30 million, $29.7 million uh, for next year as is. And that does reflect, as I indicated, the changes that we discussed at, at several of the public meetings. Uh, that's a decrease of about uh, $450,000 from the current year budget, uh, again, about 1.5%. Um, this resolution provides uh, authorization and appropriations uh, for all the city's uh, operating funds, including the general fund, the special revenue, enterprise fund operations, uh, capital funds, or debt service funds. Uh, this also sets the city's uh, tax levy for next year at $13,474,409. And uh, so I can find the sheet on that. And that is uh, an increase of about $250,000 over the current year's tax levy, uh, just under 2%. And uh, that will have a, an effect on the, the tax rate uh, for this year. Uh, it's, at, at this point, uh, the, the rate. Uh, and this is an estimated rate because we haven't received final uh, values from the state as of yet uh, of ten dollars and twenty one cents per thousand valuation uh, that's an increase of about eighteen cents 
over the current year's rate. And with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions you may have regarding the budget for 2012. Is there a motion to approve? Motion by Haynes. Is there a second? Second by Spritzer. And Councilor Hammond. Councilor DeForest. Yes, thank you. Um, I guess I, I would like assurance that as a body we have the right to revisit the budget and amend it at any point if we decide we need to. Um, I guess maybe Mr. Casper can answer this. Um, how many city councilors does it take to uh, request a budget amendment um, and what I mean is there a process in place to request that that discussion take place if you could comment on that well if uh, there have been obviously uh, amendments uh, during uh, a given fiscal year to two budgets and um, typically that process is uh, uh, handled through the the agenda preparation uh, procedure and then ultimately the city council meetings as as any other mm -hmm. decision of the council so can an individual city councilor request at any point of the the city council president to include a, an agenda item to discuss budget amendment is, is that possible or Sure, I, I think you're you're free to do that uh, through council president, uh, through city manager, uh, at any time. Okay, I just I just wanted to make sure um, because I I guess in my mind uh, the budget is a living document, <laughs> so I just would like to emphasize that, and that um, we have the authority to revisit it if need be. So thank you. Thank you. Councilor Uno. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I guess I'd like to, to follow up. So uh, if we did decide, uh, if, if, we, if it was on the agenda that we were going to consider, does it take a simple majority or does it take a super majority to, uh, to change the, the budget? If, if that was directed to me, yes, uh, Councillor, 